Hi, I'm Tim, welcome to Watchbox, and thanks for logging on. Our casting call to our worldwide online audience of watch collectors has borne fruit. It is my distinct pleasure and honor to welcome Richard T. Van to the show. Thank you, Tim. Pleasure to be here. And honestly, I am breathless. You have shocked me with the most eclectic, broad-based, non-repetitive, theme agnostic collection of watches I have ever seen in one place. 40 watches on the table, everything from Grunefeld Brothers to Kerry Voudelain and to G-Shock. Let me ask, how did watch collecting start? What was the genesis? Genesis was, I always loved watches just from when I was a kid. Um, at a flea market, I do remember buying a pocket watch that had a Panerai sort of look to it with uh, loom and numbers that glowed of the light application. So it started from there. Moved up to Timex, uh, as we spoke before, the Iron Man. Yes. Uh, when I was, you know, working out a little bit more. And they were great, but they lasted for a year because the bands broke on them. Always annoyed me. Um, but I loved the big numbers on them. Moved on to G-Shocks. And as I mentioned, I did bring two of them, uh, two limited edition G-Shocks. And I, I hated the G-Shocks because I thought they were ugly. You know, but then you know, I ended up buying 13 of them, so I guess I learned to, to like them and appreciate them for their, for their beauty uh, in their ugly type of setup. But it's a great watch. Um, I've had them for many years, and it sort of blossomed really from, from that and, and buying different colors to match different things and for different uh, things that I did with my life. Fishing, I bought one with a tide, so we knew we could go clamming. Um, you know, and the limited editions, uh, you know, the yellow uh, is perfect for the beaches and, and for pool. And I don't feel at all any problem going into the water when I was wearing a G-Shock. But we'll get onto that a little bit later oh, as I've grown with certain watches taking them in as well. Now you mentioned you know, kind of the beginnings of your, your collecting passion. You said your mom was interested in watches when you were a kid. Yeah. Uh, that's the first time I've heard that. It's usually dad or grandpa. Could you explain that a little bit? Yeah, she probably had like six or eight, uh, nothing like a Rolex or anything like that, but you know, a Disney Poo watch she loved and various other watches that she had, uh, some, you know, uh, from her mother too, brought over from Italy. So, you know, it, it just started there probably, you know, with my mom subconsciously. We never really discussed it, you know, a lot. You know, we, we talked about it. Um, and then, you know, she supported me going to the flea markets and picking up little trinkets. I wish I still had them today, but I do not have them. But you've got the memories. I have the memories. And that was the start of what was to become my eclectic collection and uh, what I did. Now, from those early days, uh, Richard has advanced to create a collection where Alexander Shokarov and Rolf Long coexist alongside the likes of Glasuta Original, Grand Seiko, the Grunefelds, Kerry Voudelain, Moser, Beauvais, and I'm running out of breath here. But let me just ask you, before we jump to the next stage of your collecting career and how that developed, how do you go about planning a purchase? Or does it just catch you? Because this seems to have no rhyme or reason to it other than that they're all a lot of fun. Um, I love all aspects of horology. And what do I mean by that is I love to watch Tim Maso reviews on social media, uh, as well as other uh, YouTubers and, and, and watch nerds, for lack of a better term. Um, I do a lot of you know research on new watches. I'm interested in uh, all the events, yearly events. I go to the Watch Time Show in New York. Um, I'm in several Facebook groups, uh, run a few, created a few. For us, you know, seeing is believing and, and that has led to a new marketing scheme for especially independence. Um, something that while you might see my collection being so eclectic and what has been developing over the years has been a want to really spend my money more with the independents than with the uh, traditional manufacturers. I say that, but I do have traditional, I have a lot of Reachmont here, of and, and, and I will continue to, to own those watches. It's just, I think you get more of a 
personalization when you're dealing with an independent uh, watchmaker. And I think it's interesting to show these alongside just kind of the scope of Richard's collection. He has the likes of Rolex, Breitling, and Omega, alongside Alexander Shokorov, Sartori Billard, and Rolf Long, alongside the likes of Moser, and of course, Voudelain, and of course, the Grunefelds. Um, but he's also got Richemont. He has Swatch with Glossuta Original and Omega, and you've got LVMH with Zenith. So I don't really see anything, I, I suppose, that would represent a pattern. So would it be accurate to call your collection organic? It just sort of happens emotionally. Yeah, I, I think that's a very good point. Um, I have to have an emotional attachment to the watch, as we mentioned, and I'm not going to mention any specific, very popular watches, um, but I just wouldn't envision having them in my collection, even if I bought them at retail. Now, I should say the Rolf is on loaner. It is not part of my collection. It's a beautiful watch, uh, but Rolf is the father of Marco Long, and most people are more probably familiar with Marco, uh, but Ralph has obviously been in watchmaking his entire life, taught uh, Marco everything he knows, and does produce. This is a Canaletto and is doing a one-year tour uh, started by uh, Bill Sanders when he met with Ralph Lang on a trip. So we are, uh, you know, February is my month, and I'm enjoying the watch very much. And you can see it's a beautiful watch, oh, yeah. um, very unique. And I think that's the type of thing that I like. I think the uniqueness... Um, I prefer not to have on what you know every everyone else is is wearing. I would show you what might be the most elaborate regulator structure I've ever seen in a watch. So this is a little bit like the Moser Pioneer Tour. It's going from from collector to collector yes. around the world. Yes, I did have uh, you know that watch for a, a few weeks as well. Now. Back to kind of your journey, and we talked a little bit about the early years. You mentioned during the 1980s you were working on Wall Street, and your, I, I guess you went on a group trip with your company to see the movie Wall Street, yep. and you mentioned that you had a related Rolex experience. Yes, yes. Or, uh, or, or I, I was it a Rolex? The, uh, <laughs> the $10 Rolex uh, bluesy on uh, the Manhattan streets, under no pretenses thinking it was a real Rolex, uh, nor was the salesperson there on the street corner. Um, you know, pretending that it was a real Rolex to me. And I actually, I did spend $10. I think I talked him down from 15 at the time. That's called the Chamber Street <laughs> Discount. <laughs> it was a uh, decent watch. I don't know what happened to it, but, you know, it lasted for years, quite honestly. So um, it was, you know, that, you know, look at that. I don't have a bluesy, but that is something, you know, in the future that I might look to get an older version of the uh, bluesy uh, in my collection. And now, you started with proper mechanical watches. You mentioned Bauman Mercier, and you said about 13 years ago you started getting really in to mechanical timepieces, yeah. and you started working your way up from accessible mainstream brands to somewhat more mid-market, Omega, Rolex, Breitling type brands. Could you tell us yeah. a little bit about that progression and how you experienced yeah. it? Again, loving horology, I would buy horology books, a bunch of, of different ones, and, and doing the research online, and it's, you know, you want what you see. So you might see, for example, the Reversos. I thought they were very cool. Um, this Art Deco type of, I call it a vintage watch, it's uh, from the 1990s. Yes. Uh, most of my collection is from that, you know, forward. Um, that, you know, I wanted to have, and it's got a beautiful uh, Patek, uh, seal movement yeah. uh, in it, as well as, you know, a great dial. Now, what I also think is particularly interesting about this watch, and I had a very similar example, albeit without the power reserve, was the presence of the hand-painted brigade numerals on the dial. Th those aren't just like stamped, as, as they often are with a, a pneumatic press. Those are actually lettered by hand and they have these wonderful serifs to them. So that's a great choice, and I can totally identify with it because I had a very similar model. Now, it seems like you, you, do have, you do have the mainstream brands between Zenith and Panerai and Giger Lecoultre and IWC. You do have a decent Richemont representation, uh, but it doesn't seem like you have any particular brand loyalty, even within the groups. Uh, what draws you to watch is as disparate as a vintage Portofino and a... Radio Mir 1940. Like, okay. how do you choose? Okay. So, with this watch, I you know love the moon phase. The I love the black see. dial, and the moon phases are, you know, something that I do love. Again, people say it's a useless complication, but not for me. I, I look at these watches as being really a piece of art. 
Um, and I think the moon phases, for me, bring me back to those old types of clocks that you see from the 13th, 14th century that built that in, where sun-moon type of complications were uh, part of what they did even way back then. I, I think it's probably the most romantic of complications. So in a lot of ways, it embodies the whole watch hobby because it is completely unnecessary, but it's wonderfully mm. emotional. Yeah. I think for uh, Panerai, I, I think it's a very distinct look. I'm, I have a very large wrist, so the Panerai sort of plays well with my wrist size. Um, that dial is, is a beautiful blue, it's a Mediterranean blue. Um, and I was really encapsulated by that dial. The back of the watch is a Panerai movement. Um, it is one of the few watches that actually has the zero reset and not just hacking uh, on it, that movement, which people generally associate with higher end watches. Um, and it's a micro rotor as well. Yes. Now, so, what I've. Okay. Continue. No, it just with, with this Panerai, um, I have two Panerai, potentially more in the future. It's, you know, so, a brand that I do love. I think with them, it's part of the learning experience over you know 20 years learning of do you buy new do you buy gray market do you buy used let's talk about when to buy new when to buy used or when to buy gray market uh when does each one make sense for you i think depending upon the watch is it available in these markets and is it available from sellers that you'd want to buy in markets um speaking about a uh, the white gold Daytona on Oysterflex, like you see most of these on the used market in the US, they're around, let's say 30, 30 and change, give or take. Um, there was one seller that pops up at 22,000. <laughs> you know, amongst all the C24, I think it was C24, but it, it's on the internet. So you have to ask yourself, is that too good to be true? Why are they selling a used watch at 8,000 below what everyone else is listing it at? So th that's something that I would take into consideration. I don't jump at the, the best deal. Um, but for some watches, especially Panerai, there could be a great depreciation where it makes sense to buy them on the used market. So I think that is uh, good reasoning. If, in fact, with the uh, Glashut original, the Senator, um, I bought it new from you know an AD and I got an incredible discount on it where it was actually better than a used price on it for that model at the time when I purchased it. So I look at prices for all three and then weigh the risks and the benefits of each. Um, if all being the same, I rather would buy new, obviously from the store, you get the boxes, you get a hat, you get, you know. Yeah, right, the chocolates, <laughs> the, the water. Exactly, uh, but that for me, it's it's about the watch it's and about the, uh, you know, the price. If at the same point, um, you know, a Parmigiani that, that I have is, is a great watch we spoke about. Um, I think a very high horology uh, type of brands, but they take a beating on the, the retail you know, market. So you can pick up a nice watch at a good uh, you know, 50 percent off of probably the manufacturer price on the used market, if not more on some of these watches. Um, and, and I could see that when, if you're getting the same product and you know you have confidence in the seller uh, you know some yeah. watches as beautiful as they are you do have to say i'm not sacrificing any part of the emotional experience if i take a little bit of money off by buying either pre-owned or or gray market plus, no plus you can buy more watches <laughs> that's right too if you save the money and uh, you spend the money on another watch that's honestly what i've done with with a lot of the brands and my self-justification to say i saved a lot of money on this watch or, and i go looking oh what, what watches do i have on my hit list that are within this range and i i would go and start all over again it's like playing with a rubik's cube and when you match all the colors you're broke i know that feeling <laughs> so let's talk about when it makes sense to buy new and i think this is a great example of that grunefeld eight second remontoir tell me a little bit about how you found the brand and decided to go with this model well in doing the research and looking at some top finishing watches, I wanted to, to go to that higher end where you're going to get the type of finishing that you look at and you just say, you know, wow, type of watch that you want to wear that maybe I'll flip it over and not even have the dial on top. I'll just wear it showing the movement. Um, one of the watches was looking into was a datagraph from, you know, our friends, uh, again, the German watches. You're going to see a theme. I do have a lot of German watches, which I think are uh, very well made. 
I think as overall for to stereotype in a good way, I, I can say I've never been disappointed in any, and I have some lower end German watches not here, uh, you know, an Aristo and, and some others that came that I'm like, wow, they really they do a great job. So. Um, you mentioned Stoa at one point? Yes, I do have a Stoa, which is right here, too. I do have a clean dial LE Stoa. We'll bring but that up. The, the point with, you know, you know back to the Gronfeld, yeah, this is one of the best finished watches, in my opinion, uh, on the back end. Um, add to it that they had an option for a carry bespoke dial. So uh, Carrie Voodelin actually does the dials for some of these watches. Um, learning about them, there was only 188 that would be made because they're so difficult to make and time consuming uh, for, for the company, which is, I think, you know, 10 people we're talking about here. It's not, you know, a, a cast of thousands here. They make, these watches were soon going to be out of circulation and, and, you know, on the used market, not coming up too often. So again, if you look at here, are they available? Great. Not really. Uh, are they available new from different dealers? Yes, you can get maybe a, a better discount from, from a different dealer, but the reality is you have a limited market for this watch. Um, I did pass up, <laughs> thinking this watch would last at, at, at uh, my AD, and would say I'll probably pick it up you know, come the new year. Well, it didn't. It got snapped up about a week later. I waited on and learned a lesson. So when the watch became available again, um, I know I needed to jump on if I really wanted this watch, and I did. So I did jump on it, and I'm very happy I did. It's like the best plate at Thanksgiving. It comes around once. There will not be a second pass. Correct, correct. It's like, you know, like the, the ants, uh, great cake that everyone loves, and if you have a large family, you better get a piece quick, or you're not going to see it. Let me ask, how did you make that transition? Because you do have, of course, you've got Breitling, you've got Rolex, and you have Omega right here. How did you make that jump, you know, after your early days getting started with Balmain Mercier, moving into some of these mainstream luxury brands, you discovered independence and in a big way. Not just the likes of Grunefeld and Carrie who we've seen so far, but also examples like Alexander Shokorov of Germany or, you know, Moser of Schaffhausen. Is there like a specifically an attraction to the relationship you get with your watchmaker? Yeah, definitely. Um, especially, you know, Moser, the, the AS, you know, I have actually spoken with Edward, um, the CEO, we'll be, the CEO of Moser, the, the Malin family uh, purchased Moser a number of years ago, and you get to see what their values are. You get to see what their goals are as far as a watchmaker. Um, I always loved Moser. The dials, I think, are some of the most striking and beautiful in the business. And being able to touch base with them and then buying into and understanding where the company is going and what they're doing and how they're doing it um, plays a, a big role for me. Um, the Sartori Billard, I, I'd like to mention it, you know, I have a, uh, an FB Journe Blue and then I, I noticed that they had some good watches. I was aware of the manufacturer, uh, but then he started producing titanium dials and he came out with a blue dial, which was fantastic. Um, I would have definitely went with the blue dial for Sartori Billard, but the fact I had the FB Journe Blue, which is one of the greatest blue dials ever, it made me say, you know, what could we do? And if you know about titanium, you heat it up, it goes from a color change of a um, titanium color to gold, uh, purples, and then blue. I wanted burgundy, so right before it turns sort of purple, it goes burgundy. And this is a burgundy version, and if you put it up, you could say it's a little purplish, but if you put it up next to a purple dial, which he did for me, um, sent me a, a 12 dial sample of dials to pick from, then picked the dial out and started building the watch for me. It's a bespoke watch, it's all handmade. Um, you have many colorful dials, by the way. Yes, I do. <laughs> I like colored dials. You see, different color spectrums are good for matching with ties or, or clothing. But you're able to get, like for a watch that costs a few thousand dollars, a bespoke experience that he is showing you every step of the process. Here are the hands I made for you. I polished them today, sending some macros. You put this under a loop, it will stand up with watches much more expensive than on this table, to, to, to be quite honest. And so you, you're not getting that type of manufacture, I think, when you're buying the, the, the mass-produced watches, which is why I do appreciate the independence. <laughs>